This episode was recorded live at the Gerald R. Ford Amphitheater. Conversations on Dance at the Vail Dance Festival is generously underwritten by the town of Vail. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Vail Dance Festival for Conversations on Dance. My name is Michael Sean Breeden. And I'm Rebecca King Ferraro, and we're happy to be here this year. I'm happy to be back. Yes. Sitting next to Michael. We've been co hosting the podcast Conversations on Dance for the past seven years, and it is our deepest pleasure to come out here to the Vail Dance Festival and get to let the audience have a, a deeper look into the artists of the festival. And then today we have. Well, we have this beautiful music in the I back. I know, I love that. Um, but we are, we are joined by an incredible author, Jennifer Homans, who wrote um, one of the most important books of the decade, in my opinion, uh, about dance, um, Mr. B, that came out last year. And we just can't wait to dive in and hear all about this incredible book. Thank you for joining us. And thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so, so, Jennifer, we would love to hear... Um, before we get into the book and your own writing, a little bit about your own experience as a dancer. What was um, your tr- early training like and um, your relationship to ballet? You know, my early training was um, so influenced by Balanchine and by the, by the School of American Ballet because I had had a little bit of training as a child. And then when I was about 16, I was sort of dropped into the world of George Balanchine and the New York City Ballet. This was in the late 70s. And I remember going for my audition and I walked in. I was sort of a kid from the Midwest and the whole thing happened in Russian. (laughs) And I was a little shocked. And then I found out that many of the teachers at the school were Russians who had been born at the turn of the century. And, you know, sometimes they would stop class and they would say, okay, that's enough with doing, now we're going to sit and we're going to tell you stories. And they would tell us all about you know, Paris in the 20s and about leaving during the revolution. It was, it was already sort of starting. This whole history was coming towards me from the very start. So, Who, who were some of those teachers that would, would tell like you Like Danilova, Dubrovska especially. Um, those were the two main ones that, that would do that. But sometimes Chumkovsky a little bit. I mean... Kramborevsky loved to talk about his life. (laughs) (laughs) That's so interesting because Michael and I talk sometimes when we are teaching that sometimes students are just like, we're doing an Erebus to do an Erebus. That's what our teacher told us. There's not that context behind it. And a lot of teachers don't offer that to their students sometimes. So I love hearing that they're giving you this rich history, this understanding of it's not just we put our hand on the bar, we do our plies. It's so much more than that. And so I wonder what that sparked in you to you know, investigate more about the art form. I mean, I think it, it just, uh, the whole thing fascinated me so much. And also just the whole nature of ballet. And then and what is this strange art where people turn out their feet and do these things that are so demanding. And so I wanted to try to figure that out. And I was sort of that person who, I came from a very academic background. So I was always walking across the street during the time off from classes to go to the New York Public Library. And I was just reading all of these books. And then at night I would be at the theater watching these Balanchine ballets. I mean, every night we would sneak in some way or another, you know, drop the ticket down and 10 of us would go in on one ticket, that kind of thing. (laughs) (laughs) But they didn't care. They knew we were doing it. It was part of our education. And it was just such an overwhelming experience for me to see these works and these dancers. It just never left me. My whole life, I've been trying to figure out what happened in those years and who Balanchine was and what it was all about. Did you have any personal interaction with Balanchine or did you sort of see him as a figure from You know, I was lucky. I mean, who who knew at the time that I would then embark on this this decade-long project to try to write a book about him? But he was around. I took his class. I met him briefly. I watched him rehearse. Um, I was an extra in some of the dances he set because they would bring in students from the School of American Ballet and even in Adagio Lamentoso, one of his, his later works in 1981, which was really a sort of staging of his own death. It was a remarkable thing to be a part of because it was only performed once. 
-hmm. So it was, you know, I did have a taste. I knew what his physique was like. I knew how he presented himself. I knew how he was in a room with dancers. So that helped me a lot. And saw so many of these important dancers, too. And saw so many important dancers and worked with Suzanne Farrell and Maria Tallchief and, you know, lots of people that, um, that had been deep parts of his lives more than I knew at the time. Right, right. right. So when did academia start to pull a little bit harder than, than the ballet world for you? Well, you know, I danced professionally for, I don't know, somewhere between eight and ten years. And then um, I had an injury, like so many of us. And I found myself, you know, at home reading a lot of books. And I thought, huh, this is actually kind of good. And I... I I, I sort of knew I would always end up making a tra transition. I was in my late 20s. I decided this was the time to, to stop. So I actually got back in shape so that I knew I could do it. And then I decided I would go to college, which I had never done, like so many of us. You know, we start so young. And, and so I, um, I, I went to Columbia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a professional dancer, because you had such an analytical mind and you were so interested in the history, I know some of us take notes, some of us do this research, go to the library. What were those kinds of things that you did outside of the studio to prepare yourself for different roles that you would dance? Well, you know, there were two things, I suppose, if I think about it. One is I started really, once Dubrovska sat us down and started talking, I, I was sort of always asking her questions. Mm -hmm. And I would go to Danilova's house for tea and ask her questions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I did not tape or write those down. I was going to say, do you have notes? Oh, no. <laughs> no, um, and then, you know, they would say things. Like, Danielle, I remember her walking into the studio one afternoon while I was taking probably my third class of the day, and she said, mm -hmm. put on your clothes and go to the Met. You've done enough dancing for today. Mm -hmm. And so I did. Right. I, you know, so, so there was sort of permission to look at culture broadly and not to be so focused on can I do this? And how am I going to train my body to do three pirouettes instead of two? And so there was a kind of, this, this whole Russian background gave it a, a context Weird. that was sort of interesting from the start and, and I think sort of spurred a lot of my curiosity about it. Right. Yeah. So what were some of your first writings about dance? What, 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 what was inspiring you in the beginning and what were some of your early writings like? I mean, I was, you know, my early writings about dance had to do with, I, I, I then went to NYU and did a PhD in modern European history, and I thought I would leave it all behind. I mean, this was part of my, like, long walk away from dance, and then my quick run back, mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And I just realized, uh, you know, people said to me, there's no archives for that, and I thought they were right. You know, you can't do a history of dance. You can't write about dance because there's no text and it's it's performed once and it's lost and there's these efforts at notation but they don't really give us a record so what exactly are you writing the history of mm -hmm. and then i thought well i'm going to go find out so i went to paris and i went to a couple of other archi i went to some archives and i started really digging around and i found out you know what you can do this mm -hmm. and i i tried to sort of figure out how i was going to do it and and that that started the process right. of me trying to write about dance. I, I started writing about criticism while I was working on the PhD, and that was kind of an accident of meeting someone. And and but it was sort of natural for me in a way because I had for years been, you know, even as a dancer, been bringing my notebook into the theater <clears throat> when I would watch dance because I found that if I wrote it down, I wasn't doing anything with it. I was just writing it down for myself. Then I knew what, it, what I thought about it. I, I couldn't figure it out. Right. Somehow the jump between this word of doing and action and the, and the world of words was something I needed to make. Hmm. And what were some of those notes that you would write? Would it be your thoughts or would you be saying, oh, this particular step was right or this part of the choreography? I mean, you know, as a dancer, I was always looking for that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but I was also trying to figure out what is this, not so much um, what is this about, but I, I, I gradually came to see that, that dance is also a form of ideas. It's, it's a history of ideas as much as it is of 
dances. So that behind or within, not behind, within really, a dance, there are ideas. They do it this way, not that way. Mm -hmm. They choose this music, not that music. They choose that set, not this one. Why? So then I started to sort of see that this world on stage was almost like a little human society. And you could watch it and you could sort of try to figure out what were they doing? What did they believe in? Why did they make those choices? Or right. at least you could try. Right. right. Uh, I, I find it a little amusing that, you know, you were saying your initial impression was that dance history couldn't be written about successfully. And then you decide that for your first book, you're going to go write like the most comprehensive dance history book of all time. Um, so that's a pretty big leap. But let's talk about what, what took you there. Um, how did the idea for Apollos Angels come about? And what were some of your first steps? Or did it did it happen over time? What, how, what was that process? Yeah, exactly like you? what you said. It happened over time. I mean, it grew out of a, you know, a sort of long study that I was doing actually for the dissertation, you know, on French ballet in the, around the revolution and the uh, romantic period. And I thought, okay, well, you know, when I finish it, I'll publish it as a book the way people do when they're in academia. And then um, somebody said to me, well, that's a little specialized. I mean, can you do something a little broader than that? And I said, oh, sure. You know, why don't we just do the whole thing? <laughs> and I thought, you know, maybe like six months for the Renaissance, six months. I plotted it all out, a couple of years. And then, you know, 12 years later, <laughs> 10 years oh later, it, it was obviously a, a gross mis misunderstanding of the depth of these um, historical moments, right. you know. Well, what was some of the research that you did? Where did you kind of, once you decided, you're like, okay, I'm going to tackle it. How did you kind of start going about putting all of this together? Palos Angels, I yeah. did it step by step. I mean... Uh, place by place, you know, like in, in chunks. Mm -hmm. So, Renaissance Italy, Louis XIV in France. Uh, you know, and I, for each time, p each time period, I did a, a whole volume of research in archives. And then also with people. For example, during the, the, the Louis XIV period, I worked with French dancers who had tried to reconstruct some of these dances to learn what they had learned uh, from the notation that existed at that time, the Foyer notation and, and others. So, you know, it was a kind of mixture. And then sometimes, you know, in later periods where there was no t notation, I found um, all of these scribblings that choreographers would make to keep their own notes you know, written down classes, things that were very, they were great sources. So I actually went into the studio and I tried to put those together myself. I hired a violinist. What was he, what was the music like? Because I had a musical score to go with it. So I, so I was able to get a sense of what these dances were like then mm -hmm. from the sources of the time, which was really interesting to do. Right. I'm just, in my head, I'm kind of likening what it's like for you to write a book to maybe the process of what it's like for me to stage a ballet you know there's parts that are there are parts that i know will go quickly and that i'll enjoy and that and then other parts that are you know there's a density or something that i like don't want to tackle what, what, what would that be like for you like are there is parts of history that are just you know there are the recordings are not available or you know archives are not as strong as there are for other things. Were there parts that you were kind of like, oh, I'm dreading this moment, but I have to, it's important to the book. Yeah, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't anticipate what they would be. In fact, some of the moments that I thought were going to be the strongest were the hardest, like Nover. Nover, there's great sources. Mm -hmm. I was sort of, well, I've got great sources. And, they, and, you know, for each part, I would also be reading a lot of history because it really is a, a history book. So politics, culture, everything that was going on at the time, how people have approached that moment in the past, what does it stand for, Where, you know, what were people trying to achieve. And th the moments that were difficult were really, in a way, writing problems for me. Hmm. And I didn't encounter them until I got to the actual moment of writing. I had tons of research, you know, pages and thousands of pages of research. And then how to, where does that fit in the argument? What is it telling me? I, I would just sometimes, you know, like with Nover, the Russians were hard too. The Soviet period, because it's so fraught politically, 
um, how to talk about dance, and there, there were people still living that I was interviewing who had been through that period. I went to Russia and I interviewed dancers who had been active in the Soviet period, and, but then their testimony is questionable, so you have to be careful because you don't know what they're trying, why are they telling you that? Right. Mm. What do they want to convey about a period that was from westernized not so great, yeah. you know, so choreographically anyway, dancers everybody recognizes were great. So there was a way in which that was very tricky to, mm -hmm. and I ended up doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of people and it was important to go there and really yeah. be in the studio with these people. Right, right. As well as reading about them. Yeah. This this is a question also for Mr. B that we wanted to bring into this, but as we know, dancers can be opinionated and they maybe have a different version of events like you're mentioning here. So how do you kind of dig through what can be gossip and then what can be the truth and then and kind of meet somewhere in the middle? Um, the main way that I did that was by just learning... Um, by the volume of information. Right. So, you know, if a story was coming through and I was kind of like, hmm, I would make sure I had it three times from three different people or that I had it from other sources, like archival sources as well, that I could piece it together. As I got deeper and deeper into the book, I, I, I had a pretty good nose for what was being told. Mm -hmm. And then the other interesting thing is that, you know, gossip is a source. <laughs> gossip is definitely <laughs> a source wrong. because <laughs> it, it shapes what happens. Mm -hmm. That's true. People gossip, they think they know what happened. A story goes out there. Did Suzanne sleep with Mr. B or didn't he? You know, Suzanne Farrell. Right. You know, these sorts of things, these were like high gossip areas. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why do people care so much? Well, that becomes the question. And then you're trying to sort of sort through the, the story, but also the stories about the story. So there's a kind of layering of effect that has to be also captured in the writing because... I mean, in the end, the reality that we all create for ourselves is partly fictional. So right. how you navigate that landscape is is quite complex. And yet you don't want to, I didn't want to, I decided not to bring the reader into that necessarily, but to present it as a as a story with some complexity implied. But, but I wasn't going to do a meta a job, you know, where there's all these layers that everybody has to sort through. I wanted it to read like a right. like a novel as much as I could, right. you know. And it does. Yeah. Before we move on to Mr. B completely, I want to just talk a little bit up about the epilogue of Apollo's Angels, okay. which I'm sure <laughs> maybe you're a little sick of hearing. Never gotten this <laughs> but, question um, before. Yeah, never <laughs> ever. But um, you know, the book finishes with this epilogue discussing the potential future of ballet or issues with the future of ballet and it was certainly a hot button topic of discussion i'm wondering did that surprise you in the time that it, of its release and then now 13 years later or so how do you feel about the epilogue you know it did surprise me i wasn't expecting it because i i suppose i'm almost never expecting the responses that come because when i'm writing i'm really not thinking about you right. or right. you. I'm really not. I, I actually have a kind of relationship with my computer <laughs> <laughs> or with my myself or with right. the subjects that I've been living with. I mean, writing a book like Apollo's Angels is like living with all this whole like world of people that are dead and they, but they, uh, they populate my mind for most of the day, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm in conversation with them and less with I, I learned because even as a critic you have to like I'm doing this because my uh, my late husband once said to me would you get all those people off your shoulder just take them off your shoulder because they're going to ruin your writing you ah. know so other critics other this you know the person you you care most what they think about your writing you just gotta like get them off your shoulder and and then be true to the the subject of course it doesn't always work but but mostly, mostly it did. Now the epilogue, once it kind of raised a little bit of a, a tempest in a teapot, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wasn't sorry. Isn't it good to create a little bit of a conversation? Yes. Um, you know, the idea that this art form has certain ideas behind it 
including, you know, a sort of de decade long at least sort of monastic training in a way and a, an art form that is fully embodied at a time when the world is moving towards a virtual, a more virtual life and a more virtual entertainment realm. Uh, the, just the vast changes that were happening across society and across culture w seem to me to be valid points of inquiry as to w how's this going to go, you know? And the question of race, lo lots of things that the, the dance, the ballet world in particular needed to sort of look at. And it, I wasn't like scolding anyone. I was just saying like, look what this is and look where we are as a culture, what do you think? <laughs> right. What do you think? Are we, is this gonna keep going? Are people gonna be interested? Mm -hmm. you, you do have to talk to the audience, right? right? I, want, so, I, bet, I bet it really changed the way that people, decision makers within the industry were thinking. They were like, we have the responsibility now to move it forward I maybe I Hopefully. don't know but you know I mean I'm a historian I just go back to my office and do my other <laughs> my next project but I mean for me that was a question I had and so that's why I put it in there I will and it seemed to me a, a, I was glad when people were discussing it I, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of reasons for change in the in the dance world in the last decade, and um, you know, yeah. you've you've covered a lot of that in your in your podcasts, and uh, so I wouldn't want to claim that that my book did that, but um, but I I think it's always you know, and it's the other thing is that it's part of this closed culture that the dance world can sometimes, and the ballet world in particular, can sometimes be a part of. And you know, people in other fields, in art, in literature, in theater, were asking this kind of question about their own art forms. It's not an insult. Mm -hmm. If anything, I mean, I've spent my life on these things, so mm -hmm. I didn't think of it as an insult to people. It mm -hmm. was really out of admiration and love. Yeah. Let's shift then to, to going into your office, to finding your next subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what did you have this idea about writing a book about Balanchine while you were writing Apollo's Angels, or did you take some breathing time? What how did we get into the next book? Um, well, it was a natural next subject, number one, right? It it was, and I was a little intimidated by it. Could I do it? I wasn't sure, so I sat there for a while thinking about that. It was sort of the, the presence that was in my life because of the things that we were talking about earlier about my own training and the, you know, most of the work that I performed professionally was Balanchine's work. There were other things too, but that was the most remarkable to me. So, um, so it was a natural subject. It's also, I mean, all books are personal too, in a way. and you know, not to sort of overshare, as they say, but I was in a very difficult moment in my own life. I had had a lot of loss, and I didn't know what kind of writing was going to come out of that. And so I was, um, found myself drawn to Balanchine because I had a kind of instinct, I think, that that there was a lot of loss in his life and in his dances. I found myself going to something like Serenade, you know, for a certain kind of, oh, okay. Um, and so I, I was drawn to him, I think, for reasons that were also reasons that were in my life, both in my past, but also in that present moment, right. that I didn't know really what those reasons were until maybe seven or eight years later into the research for the book mm -hmm. when I w was discovering more and more about his life that I didn't know. Right. I was wondering while you were speaking about all the research that you did for Apollo's Angels, and we've also recently talked to you about how much then, of course, you did for this book. Was there any overlap? I'm sure you don't get rid of any of those notes that you take. <laughs> They're probably, what, where are they? Stored somewhere? Right? Yeah, yeah, big file cabinets. Yeah. <laughs> so was there overlap? Was Did you go back and did you take a look at some of that stuff? Oh, to yeah, inform? for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, the hardest parts of, of Mr. B to write were the parts that did overlap. Interesting. Because once you've written something, it's really hard to write it again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, 
it's like set. And so how do you use that in like the Diaghilev period, for example? You know, I, there, there's a lot on Diaghilev in Apollos Angels. How do I get that out without just like sort of cutting and pasting? Because right. it's not the, I don't need that, but I need a lot of that information. Mm -hmm. But oh my God, am I gonna write that again? That's exhausting. I, I can't imagine doing that. I see another biographer <laughs> nodding her head. It, it's just very hard to go over old territory mm -hmm. and make it fresh. Did you feel so, like approaching it maybe from a different perspective? Maybe gave you a different look? Yeah, it was a different perspective. But right. It was also one of those areas that we were talking about earlier where it was a hard moment because the sources were thin. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, there's a lot of sources about Diaghilev, but Balanchine and Diaghilev? You know, one of the things about Balanchine is that he basically didn't keep anything. And even when Lincoln Kirstein met him at this moment in, the, in, in his life, you know, during this whole period of Diaghilev, in this interwar uh, European period, he said the man has no reviews, he has no documents, he has nothing. He was stateless. He has nothing. He keeps nothing. He, he doesn't care about the past. Mm -hmm. So there was a way in which, you know, he had all but erased it. And the dances from that time are mostly lost right. and forgotten. So you've got a few reviews, some pictures. It's tough to reconstruct it all from that. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I want to talk for a second about something I think the book does so successfully that, to my mind, hadn't been done so much before, which is discussion of balancing as a man, you know, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in a sort of mythology about Balanchine. And certainly that's something that I loved growing up, like romanticizing this ideal of this genius. But I found it completely fascinating. And I, I it made me it deepened my appreciation of his genius to know, you know, what what made how the man made this work. Um, in particular, I think you set up so well, um, his childhood kind of uh, against the backdrop of the Russian Revolution. And it wasn't something that I had ever thought of, you know, when Balanchine would say like, oh, you know, when I was your age, I, I ate rats or whatever. It sounded something like, oh, we used to walk 12 miles in the snow and, you know, <laughs> right. yeah. but you, you make it so viscerally real and Vivid, understand yeah. that that shaped everything of of who he was going to be and how he was going to create from, from there on. Was that like a specific goal you had or just sort of how the book ended up taking shape? I think, um, you know, I, when I first started the book, I said to somebody, I'm just not sure about the organization. And he said, well, biography is easy because, you know, you start at the beginning and you end at the end. <laughs> so I did that. I started at the beginning and I started with the early life and I knew the later life better and I knew a lot of those dances better. So I started to see things as I was studying the early life and then it, it became clear to me that there was this paradox in his early life that he had, he had grown up born in 1904, under, in, in the imperial system, at the theater school, the czar's theater school, you know, as a young child, and living a kind of fantasy of imperial Russia, the courtly fantasy of it. And that, that, there are many reasons for that, including the fact that his, his mother <laughs> happened to win the lottery just before he was born. So he was born rich, even though the family was not rich. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a carriage with a white horse and, uh, you know, servants and people making... So, so there was this like a kind of fan fantasy imperial world. And then there was the revolution, which, I mean, he was very young when the First World War and the revolution and the civil wars began and the violence of that period and the trauma that he went through the illness, the spitting blood, the, the you know, we've talked about this, the, the um, pus-filled sores on his body, the starvation, the, and this didn't go on for just a, very, you know, a couple months. We're talking years. Right. And so there's that. And then there's the, the incredible inspiration of the artistic moment, which is what drives him. He leaves that imperial world. Mm -hmm. He was not a classical choreographer in that sense. He, he goes back to it. He uses it. But it's destroyed in the revolution for him. 
And he wants to be progressive and avant-garde and to take things in a new direction. And there's all kinds of stuff happening, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything from acrobatics and nude dances to to dances without story to it's it's a it's a huge period of ex, of experimentation as we all know in theater in art in dance in music mm -hmm. and he's part of that so he takes those two things out of Russia and as you say we see that kind of informing the rest of his life this pull towards this classical ideal in some ways and but it's destroyed he has to start over so he starts over with this bo this body that's that's new mm -hmm. and how, how is he going to make it and that's what he's doing yeah. the rest of his life how is he going to make it interesting i find this interesting this concept of starting at the beginning it it's of course makes sense but i can see why you would be tempted to kind of start with the things you're more familiar with as a dancer and so i wonder since you did then go that route of starting really early going through all this part of his life how did that shape and change what you started to relearn kind of about his later life and the valleys that you had danced yeah it's such a good question because of course that is what happens you know you you have uh, I mean I had these timelines and these theme lines and these like the marriages lines you know, <laughs> love and illness lines because they were you know just like all over my my study because I I was trying to keep track mm -hmm. It's different to write a whole book than to write an essay, which I had right. done quite a lot of, and, and this was the big challenge. You know, how are you going to develop these characters over time, given, but within factual parameters, right? They're not fictional characters. Stuff happened, and we need footnotes, and we need sources, and you can't make it up. But you have to, but the connections and the ways in which a person's psyche and their inner life and for Balanchine of course it's crucial because the inner life of the imagination is the world of the art so understanding his what was inside as well as what happened you know in 19 this and 19 that was was really the primary and I did that in some ways through you know, through a lot of things, through interviews, through what happened, through, but also through the dances, without trying, without being very careful not to be reductive, mm -hmm. like the life makes the dances or the dances make the life. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like that, right? Yeah. So it's it's a it was my effort to to bring all that together, right? You know, something else that I think makes the book um, really special, not everyone who writes about dance has experienced dance for themselves. And you obviously were a dancer. You had dance Balanchine's Ballets. And a friend of mine who is um, a former dancer, now writer, she pointed this out. She was like, you know, I've never read until Jennifer's writing something that could properly explain what Balanchine's Ballets make you feel. The audience, the, you know, a non-dancer audience, they need to understand why people were able, willing to give up things or why they did what they did. And you having experienced some of that for yourself enables you to communicate that in a really rich, um, obvious way. And I think that that was, that was something that I, when, as soon as she said that, I was like, that's what makes sense here, it was, is that we understand a little bit more deeply rather than just like these people seem crazy like is this a cult like are we, like why are you you know yeah. you know you don't make money and you're in a, a windowless theater why would you do that but then you 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 do delve into what the dancers were experiencing that made it so um you know such a wonderful time for them yeah i mean the the, the i i ended up talking to a lot more dancers than i thought i would at first i thought oh this is going to be very archival because i'm a historian and and you know they, they've all written memoirs, or not all, but many. Yeah. So, but in the end, I, I ended up talking to a lot of people, and many of them many times, because I was learning so much from them. And that is one of the things that I was learning from them. I learned it from my own experience, certainly, so I had an instinct for it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that these dances are amazing to dance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always say, I mean, not every night, but the coordination of the music and the body and the technique and the it's it's and the and the group it's it's an extraordinary and in my experience unparalleled Balanchine's work is like no one else's in that I know of in the ways in which you can I mean it's you truly are free 
for, for those moments. And there's a way in which it's, it's so powerful to do that, as you say, you know, and I talk to a lot, especially of women who, who had some, you know, more difficult experiences, uh, in particular, men did too, but, but women in particular with Balanchine and with it, giving that, giving up their, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, I mean, they're young and sort of giving up everything to do this, you know, that's what they would say. Do you know what it's like? We wanted to dance more than anything. That's really what we wanted. Mm. One of them even said to me, it's sex without sex. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's, it's more than that even, is what she was trying to tell me. It was, you know, it has a kind of, there, there can be a kind of transcendence to it. And they were aiming that high. I mean, as Balanchine himself would say, you know, what we're doing is a little bit, something a little bit different. It's a little bit more than ordinary life. He was interested in extraordinary life, in that whole realer than real world of the stage, so that it's not the mundane, it's not pedestrian. They're like working to make themselves into creatures, mm -hmm. beings mm -hmm. that are um, a little bit different. You know, he liked to call it the fourth dimension. Just a lot of people were talking like that at the time. Yeah. Oh, it makes me tear up a little bit, even hearing you talking about dancing his ballets. It's just so true. You know, there's been a lot of conversation recently surrounding the topic of Balanchine and, you know, it was maybe like a religious experience and maybe he was the God of that church or that religion. And so I wonder kind of what your takeaway is on that topic. Yeah, that's interesting because of course, you know, the next part of your sentence is what <laughs> it was it a cult. <laughs> And there is something <laughs> cultish about it at moments, but more in terms of its practices than in terms of, you know, it was never a cult because it was never organized around the personality of a single human being. It was not that. It was, um, it was a question of service. And they were all in service to this art. And it, they did, many people did say it was like a religion. And I think what they meant by that is that it was in some ways selfless and a way of um, really transcending the self so that you were all working together as a community through the work that he was doing with them, not like him standing there, you do this, you do that. No, he controlled the whole thing, yes. But there was a lot of freedom and a lot of back and forth. He gave people a lot of rope, and especially dancers. You know, he wanted, he couldn't, he would insist, and he was right. I can't make dances without dancers. And it wasn't that he walked into the room and had no other ideas in his head and the whole thing poured out of him. He had studied the score like a, a, a bit, like the very accomplished musician that he was. And he knew that score inside out. He would make, we have them. We have his transcriptions, piano transcriptions of scores. And he really, th this part was a little secret. He didn't share that with the dancers. But when he got into the studio, it's not like the steps were there. They were making those together. So that there's a way in which the whole thing is a, a large community, dancers, uh, designers, lighting people, stagehands, costumers. There's, there's just, you, he built an institution around him in order to be able to make these dances. And the institution was kind of anarchic. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know how to do that? Good, you go do that, you go do that. And then, you know, he would only get involved if he didn't like what was happening. Mm -hmm. But everybody had a lot, the wheels were all turning. It wasn't one giant machine at mm -hmm. all. So it's, yeah. it's an interesting thing. And I, I think the religious aspect of it comes from both his deep religiosity, he was a very religious man, almost, I came to believe, a mystic himself, because he was, as Lincoln Kirstein said, a kind of amateur theologian. He read mysticism, he read Sufism, he read, um, you know, he knew the Bible inside out. He was a, 
he was he was as he always put it in service to god i was put here by god and that's what we're doing he really really believed that i think and so there he was humble even though he knew he had a gift but the gift wasn't him the gift was from a higher source right. so you know it may this he managed to suffuse the entire theater with that feeling mm -hmm. And not that there weren't petty, what peasant pettiness, arguments, cruelties, people, you know, doing what people do, fighting, and and you know he could be mean, really mean, cruel even. Um, but overall, when the curtain went up, that's what they were there for. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you know, people are writing articles not just about this religious component, but you know, more broader things that are like. Um, it was is balancing problematic what what can we still do his ballets that that sort of things that sort of thing and um your book is often cited and in some ways i'll, I'll often be like did you guys read the same book as me that's not my case. you know <laughs> i'm kind of just curious what your thought is on those sorts of discussions that are going on now and how you feel maybe about the way that people can just interpret your work um, in their own way, in a way that maybe you didn't intend. Like, like the same thing with the epilogue. I'm sure you, you, know, you weren't intending to cause waves, but there we were. You know? <laughs> well, how do you feel about I mean, that? I guess the way I feel about all of this, and I don't follow all of those conversations, but I, I'm certainly aware of what you're talking about. And I, you know, if we wanted to negotiate any one of those, we'd have to, I think, pull out the details and be very specific because general conversations can be just not very clear right mm -hmm. so my approach in the book really was to lay it out i'm a historian I, you know it's not that i didn't have opinions of course but i was not interested in playing the role of judge i was interested in saying what happened and in trying to understand as we were talking about earlier the scope of the life the reasons not even the reasons but the 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 facts of his behavior I mean, the human animal is a strange and difficult thing. I don't, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And, you know, I, I wasn't interested, and I don't, and I think it's a bit anachronistic as well, to impose a sort of sense of, our, of, of some of the conversations and interests that people have today in purity and in um, the ways in which behavior can be... Um, behavior of an individual or of an artist can then somehow be used to uh, cancel their art if we're being direct, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I think is what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I, I um, you know, that's not my business. If people want to do that, that's, that's them now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing what they're doing. And to me, it's sort of, okay, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And I tried to lay out the the, the facts insofar as I knew them yeah. and just the, the life insofar as I could fathom it yeah. and, and the work. The work is genius. Mm -hmm. What we want to do with the rest is up to us now and it's up to people now but I don't think that part is open to too much argument. Right. There's so many books on Balanchine and I wonder how if that felt daunting to you to kind of tackle this subject and how did you feel like I'm going to make this book really stand apart and stand differently because it really does yeah you know I mean first of all most of those books were written either when he was alive or soon after he died mm -hmm. and they were written by people who knew him mm -hmm. well and people who uh, participated in the whole endeavor which you might say I did but I was really there in the beginning kind of as a I just happened to be there. I wasn't really, you know, part of it. I was never part of the New York City Valley. So, time. We have time. You know, there was time now to look back. None of those histories are archival. Mm -hmm. None of them are archival. They're not histories. They're, they're just books about Balanchine, mm -hmm. which is great, and I used them all. But um, this one was trying to do something different. The other thing is, and it, it, it sort of reflects back also on the last question that you asked, is that one of my goals was, after talking to all of these people, and especially all of these women, was really to give their testimony. Mm -hmm. And 
that's why in some ways I'm, uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's great to be able to hear what these dancers, many of them in the court of ballet, who did not write memoirs, who did not have a, a, a chance to say what they thought, and to be able to sort of give their ideas and their experiences some room. And so I tried to do that as well, just to sort of yeah. say what they said, mm -hmm. say what they told me. Were there any stories in particular that were maybe surprising to you or interesting from the court of ballet? Because it's true, we don't hear from them often. Oh, often. I mean, first of all, the one thing I learned about these dancers is they were to a single person, as far as I could tell, and I really did interview a lot of them. Yeah. They were fascinating, eccentric, interesting people oh. with ideas and imagination about what they had been doing mm -hmm. and why they were there. They, these were not people who didn't sort of think and read. You know, the, the whole, that whole world is sometimes portrayed as a place where people are so focused on doing, which of course they are, right. um, and the present moment, which of course they are, and that's one of the big mo uh, arguments of the book, you know, is this sort of idea of the radical present. Mm -hmm. But these were also people who had very diverse experiences, and they came from families that were um, often in some ways broken, and especially in the early years, not so much later, but in the early years. So there's a way in which their experiences are part of the weave of his life, and they're part of the way in which his life, I mean, they influence him, he influences them. They see themselves differently when he's watching them. I mean, just even think about the stage. He's standing in the first wing. He was always in the first wing. That's where he stood, watching. He's watching the dancer. He's not watching the audience and how they react. He's watching the dancer. The dancer is looking at the audience, but also at him. The audience is looking at them. There's this interesting sort of triangle that's going on that's shaping the way people act on stage and the way that they are. They all said if he wasn't in the first wing, it changed everything for some reason, which is, was rare. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which this, uh, they all are informing each other. It's all part of the same performance. It's not just, okay, these dancers get up, they do certain things, the musicians play, and everybody goes home. It's like this whole sort of like organic community that's created at this moment, mm -hmm. and then it's over. This is all just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we could, I could sit here for hours with you, and um, we really encourage everyone to read the book. It's so fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer, and it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And thank you all for being here. <laughs> Get Jennifer's book. <laughs> Conversations on Dance is part of the ACAST Creator Network. For more information, visit conversationsondancepod.com.